Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another super awesome, exhilarating planting episode. Actually, scratch that. Replanting episode. It's like planting, but a little bit more shameful. Although, this one wasn't our fault at all. Mother Nature is to blame. We have a few more soybean fields that need some additional help out there. We lost a lot of our crop in yesterday's video. I said our stand count was around 80,000, which is half of our original population. We made great headway yesterday, and barring an act of God, we should finish up today. Even the corn back at Dad's house has got some noticeable hail damage. Not even close to as significant as what we had over west that we're replanting. Still, could be better. I don't think the corn's been enjoying the cool weather. Leaves are kind of yellow. New growth is green, though. We got some 70 degree highs today. Should start putting on some plant mass. Our forces are a little bit divided this morning. Dad and Jeff went over to work on the hydraulic leak on the planter. Get that all fixed up. Chris and I are here waiting at the seed shed for Griffin with Don Mario to come drop off some new beans to put in the field. The first go around in this field, we planted a 3-9 enlist bean. This time, we're gonna drop it down a little bit to a 3-7, a shorter season bean. As I explained in the last video, we'd like them to mature all kind of in a relatively close time frame. That way, the minute they are ready, we can go harvest them. We don't have to wait. I do have to commend Griffin, the Burris, and Don Mario crew for their service on this one. We didn't decide until about maybe three o'clock yesterday afternoon that we were in fact gonna replant all these fields. I called Griffin maybe around 5, 30, 6 o'clock, and he told me that he would have them here bright and early this morning. Well, not exactly bright and early, but nine o'clock is close enough. Unfortunately, he had to get up at the crack of dawn because they didn't have any warehouses nearby with the seed we needed. He had to make a little bit of a trek to find the three sevens, and he's bringing them here right now. We're going to make some preparations to load them into the seed tender, and according to the boss's orders, he does not want to mess with the backhoe conveyor, which is extremely convenient. So, we we'll have to use the seed tender. To make matters worse, the boss wanted to use the double axle Unverfirth seed tender as opposed to the triple axle green J&M seed tender. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter which seed tender we use. I just prefer the J&M because it's a little bit more user friendly and has better remote connectivity, especially with that wireless controller. Anytime we just need one seed tender and none of them are hooked up, the boss always wants to use this one. I don't know if it's because it's lighter or what. It's kind of like moving up floors in a building. Sure, you could take the stairs, but why take the stairs if there's an elevator? And the elevator is the J&M tender. Maybe I just like to complain. That's part of the fun of working with family. Is the battery working? Nope. Dead. It didn't last the night. Since we're using the conveyor to fill it, we have to pull the hopper out and it pivots right there. It's a little bit less convenient, but we'll make it work. Oh, just in time. Time to load some seed. Dad's got some clutter in the way. The seed tender did not start until a bad omen for today. <laughs> Mom, you violence? A little more choking. <laughs> we didn't make it that far. Dad and Jeff showed back up. This is what was causing the hydraulic leak in that hydraulic junction box. Just a bad seal. It's actually a pretty common problem. We haven't had to deal with it yet. The first pro box is in the seed tender. Two pro boxes together is 90 units and we didn't need that much seed. So we actually have 40 loose bags. To save ourselves some effort in loading the planter, we're gonna dump some of these bags directly into the conveyor on the seed tender. Science. 
We've got some Don Mario 3756E Enlist Beans to refine. We planted the same bean that we just loaded into the seed tender last spring on one of our poorer farms, and it actually performed above our expectations. I can't quite remember the numbers off the top of my head. It did out yield some of our extend varieties on better farms, which was pretty impressive. So I'm not concerned at all about replanting these beans. Who knows, maybe they'll have higher yield potential than the three nines did before. Letting the seed tender leave before you is such a poor choice. Now I get to drive 35 miles an hour on this crappy country road. I guess we're just having a nice, easy stroll this morning. Field entrance is user's choice. They're picking there. I'm gonna cut ahead of them, get the planter lined up so we can fill in some beans. Hello, noble steed. I wasn't adequately prepared yesterday. I ran out of water about an hour into the ride. Not gonna be an issue. It is a beautiful day to be a tractor. <laughs> Let's go do some farming stuff. The final stand in this field is actually a little bit better than the field we planted yesterday. Because of that, we don't want to plant 100,000 plants per acre. We think that'll overcrowd the field or maybe just be too much. It may not have any long-term consequences in terms of standability and performance, but it could be kind of wasteful. So we're going to change the population, but I don't think this year I've showed you guys how you change your actual quick population numbers. So you see I have one through five here, I've got 300, 100, 140, 116, 120, and then six is off, but six is actually a prescription rate. So if you're doing variable rate planning, I can hit change rates. The one I'm planning on needing the least is 140,000, which is number three. So if I go to change rates, go to rate three, it pulls up here my target. Well, in these thicker spots of the field, I think 80,000 plants per acre is going to be enough. I hit accept, I hit accept again, and I go home. And now when I go to change my populations, there's 80,000. I am still going to plant the beans a little bit thicker around the outside just due to all the traffic of me replanting the field. It seems like the damage out here was much more variable, so I may have to pay closer attention to my numbers and adjust them on the fly. Planting diagonally into long rows now it is a tad bit bumpy out here. It looks like our neighbor to the west has the same idea. Replant some soybeans. Although I believe he has an actual 40 foot exact emerge planter on 30 inch row spacing. Somewhere back there in that dust, I have a 40 foot, 15 inch row hydraulic drive planter. Kind of a high speed planter when you replant if you really want. It doesn't quite like going this fast and planting this little population. I find that fascinating that there's still water out there. I was just gonna send it but I decided that wasn't a good idea. Won't go out there anyways. That is one of three fields done. On to the next one. You get a lot more done at nine miles an hour as opposed to six or seven than I normally run. I don't exactly know what this neighbor's waiting on. I'm about to plant this bean field for the second time before he's even planted his cornfield once. Whatever, not my farm. It appears to be a little bit dry over there. It just dawned on me that it's actually kind of unnecessary for me to get super close with the planter to these inlets. There's already beans out there, and having them tucked nice and close at the end of the day is irrelevant, as long as there's something growing there. That, and this is the farm with all the inlets, and I don't want to spend all day picking them up after I knock them over. Just wrapping up field two out of three. Man, this is going pretty quick. Good day of replant so far. And my truck mysteriously appeared over here at the bin site. There goes our neighbor with the exact emerge planter. Must be done replanting beans. We share a lot of adjacent fields around here, and I would imagine that they had a lot of problems with hail damage just like us. This field's actually a little bit drier than last time I planted it. Huh, I didn't realize hail could knock over inlets. Totally wasn't me with that planter track right there. Nope. I would never do such a thing. Why did you have to stop here out of all places? Now we have to pick it up. Would it even be a proper day of planting if you didn't run out of seed right at the end? I don't think so. Dusty. All we've 
we've got is that last little sliver there. Looks like we have two active whirly winds out there. That one looks pretty mean. Cleaning the road units out and leaving the field. Or well, at least this time. A little update from the crop adjusters that assess the damage on the corn and soybeans that were hit with the hail. The final report is that they're not going to pay us anything on the corn fields. Like I said a few videos ago when I explained the intricacies of hail damage, when corn is that small, its growing point is still below the soil, so it can just pop up new growth out of the ground. The soybeans, on the other hand, don't quite have that luxury. So we did actually manage to get somewhat of a hail claim on this farm and also get a replanting claim. It's really just chump change at the end of the day, but it does help go to cover our costs to bring the planter back out here and put more beans in the ground. Almost home. And it looks like we have a nitrogen bar running right now. Feed the corn crop. Might as well top off on some dino juice before we put it away. We fed the needy. Let's go put this gal in the barn so she can rest. What is that dinky little thing? Four row planter? That'd be good for sweet corn and replanting corn, which is possibly why it just showed up at our farm. Into the barn. It's probably optimistic of me to wish that this is the last time I have to pull the planter in after planting this season. Hopefully next time I'm pulling it in after we've washed it off so I can unhook it. Battery off so it doesn't die. Speaking of batteries, it's my dead camera battery I just replaced. Double battery action. I guess all the equipment in the barn can go back to resting and staying undisturbed for a while. I doubt we'll have any of this stuff out unless we're washing it off. I'm not going to ruin the surprise, but one of these pieces of equipment in here is going to be leaving the farm here and replaced with something new in the next couple months. I'll let you wait and see. Since there's not really anything else for us to do, we might as well go watch some other people work. Over the next few days, we are going to be having liquid nitrogen side dressed onto all of our corn acres. This is all being sold and serviced by Helena, another agricultural retailer. They're located north of Mattoon here, but they also are pretty prominent across the country. I don't think they're quite as big as Nutrien, but they are comparable. They are over there on the southeast corner of this field, topping off their tank with the nitrogen, and it looks like as we speak they're going to put a little bit more on. The product that they are injecting between the rows with this special low disturbance, high speed nitrogen toolbar is a 32% UAN solution. And on top of that, there is some ammonium thiosulfate with that. 
32% urea ammonium nitrate is a very common liquid nitrogen fertilizer used across the United States. As you could probably tell by the name, it is created by mixing urea and ammonium nitrate with some water at high temperatures. This creates a very stable liquid nitrogen product that is cost effective and also relatively safe to handle. Except for it tends to be very corrosive on metal. Sprayers, toolbars, all the things that deal with it, if they're not rinsed off thoroughly on a regular basis, they will suffer from rust problems. There are a couple other common mixtures of this product. You might have heard of 28% UAN or just 28 as some people refer to it as. That is pretty much the same product, a little bit different of a blend. I do believe it has a tiny bit of sulfur in it. And as you could guess by it being 28%, it's not quite as strong. 4% less. It is called 32% because it is 32% nitrogen by weight. So for every 10 pounds of product you apply, you get 3.2 pounds of nitrogen. Last crop season was the first time we ventured into the territory of splitting our nitrogen applications into two separate passes. We have the nitrogen pass in the fall that you actually saw in my video where I talked about anhydrous ammonia that was in the same exact field. They were putting on just shy of 120 pounds of actual in with that anhydrous. Anhydrous ammonia is a much stronger product, especially compared to this 32%. It is 82% nitrogen by volume, and very special precautions have to be taken for operator safety and for it to be applied correctly under the farms. And hydrous ammonia is the king of nitrogen products. It is essentially where all of the nitrogen derivatives you see, like this UAN, come from. It is one of the first, one of the strongest, and the most cost-effective sources of nitrogen that happen to come after you synthesize it out of the air from the Haber-Bosch process. I'm not even gonna talk about how they pull nitrogen from the air, that's a 20 part video, it's pretty complicated. So I can almost guarantee you're wondering, why are we applying this 32% UA into our fields if it is maybe 10% more expensive than anhydrous ammonia and less dense in terms of total pounds of N per pound of product? And that is a very good question. What you're watching right now is actually one of the main reasons that we do it. It is simple and it is efficient. Although you probably wouldn't want to drink or take a bath in this liquid nitrogen product, it is so much safer for the operator and the people who handle it, which makes the process as a whole much easier. That liquid nitrogen bar running out there is causing extremely minimal amount of disturbance, especially to our small corn plants. All that is on that is a coulter and a small narrow knife that dribbles in that liquid nitrogen product. That is all that is left behind after this runs through the field. It cuts that very small trench with the coulter and then puts in that liquid nitrogen. Unlike the gaseous anhydrous ammonia that we applied in the fall, there is no risk of this just floating away if the trench does not seal. Now you definitely want a rain to help wash it in at some point in the next few weeks. In the short term though, as long as it's not bone dry, you do not have to worry about this nitrogen being laid out there in that trench. With this method and product, farmers can cover more acres, they can do it safer, and they don't have to have those perfect conditions they need to side dress anhydrous ammonia. Not even to mention the fact that an anhydrous ammonia track through here would be much bigger. There's larger coulters, knives, and closing wheels to help cover up that product so it doesn't escape, and that can disturb these small corn plants. We can put our additional nitrogen on right now and not have to worry about our tiny little V2 plants getting covered in dirt or run over. And that is another very good point about this. The operator has a lot of room for error. That slot is maybe a half of an inch wide. On a 30 inch row, that gives them 60 inches to work with. Now the tractor tires are not as forgiving, but I trust the operator. If you get an NH3 side dressing toolbar too close to that corn, it's gonna look like the iron blight hit it. This coulter knife and dribbling system is so much more forgiving. On this farm and all of our other highly productive soils, we're shooting for 100 pounds of actual in with this side dress pass. 32% UAN has about 3.5 pounds of nitrogen per gallon of product. So they're applying about 28 and a half gallons, give or take a tiny bit out here on this farm. I was told that that toolbar has an 1800 gallon tank, so they should be able to cover 60 acres per fill up. And due to the low horsepower requirements of that operation, they can cover 60 acres pretty quick. I've probably explained this point a handful of times in the last year, but we've learned the hard way that if you don't split up your nitrogen applications and you get a very wet spring, your corn plants will really struggle to get down to that nitrogen that is deep in the ground from the anhydrous pass in the fall. Not only do really wet conditions cause the nitrogen to leach farther down into the soil, the plant roots also struggle to grow as well. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. By coming in here and side dressing this product, we know that we have nitrogen layered in the soil, even if it slowly makes its way down. By the time this corn starts to get really hungry, around July, maybe early August, it tassels, it fills its grain, 
it'll have all the nitrogen it needs to put on a very big ear and a very dense ear at that. When you tally up our nitrogen from this pass, our anhydrous pass in the fall, and our dry fertilizer application of our phosphorus product, which is DAP, diammonium phosphate, it is actually 18% nitrogen as well. So that puts us at about 240 pounds of actual in in this field, which is more than enough to grow a massive corn crop if the conditions are right. We also have added a second product to this side dressing pass, and that is ammonium thiosulfate, or ATS. It is in there purely for its sulfur content, which is considered a micronutrient for the corn crop, but it is rather important. It is one of the micronutrients that is used in the largest quantity. We've heard a lot of different theories over the last few years about sulfur in the soils. A decade or two ago, people were never worried about the sulfur content because all of our very dirty coal-fired plants were constantly putting sulfur in the atmosphere and that was causing acid rain. Well, that acid rain was putting sulfur in the ground. The data we've seen shows that sulfur has a very positive return on investment and it should give us a little bit of a yield bump, if not a pretty tremendous one. The analysis of ammonium thiosulfate is 12% nitrogen and 26% sulfur. So for every 10 gallons we put on, we're getting 1.2 pounds of nitrogen, which is a nice little bonus, and we're getting 2.6 pounds of sulfur. This may sound a little bit crazy, and I don't really understand the specifics of it, but a few people suggest that ammonium thiosulfate, and actually sulfur in particular, somehow acts as a nitrogen stabilizer. By nitrogen stabilizer, I mean that it helps prevent or slow down the process that results in nitrogen leaching through the soil. Might as well give you a quick scientific lesson on soil. All of these microscopic soil particles have a cation exchange capacity, which is essentially a rating of how good the soil is at binding to positively charged particles. Positively charged ions, which are referred to as cations, bind to this negative site on the soil. For those of you who are having a hard time kind of wrapping your mind around that, just think of two magnets. If you put two positives together, they repel each other. If you put a positive and a negative together, they stick together. That is what happens in the soil. Darker soils that have higher organic matter have much higher cation exchange capacities to lighter, more marginal soils. This has a lot to do with the productivity difference we're talking about and why we have to be very careful with how we treat farms with different soil types. They just don't have the same properties. One of the best ways to visualize this concept is to think of each individual soil particle as its own parking garage. Darker soils with higher organic matter have a capacity to hold a lot more cars whereas lighter, less productive soils are more like multi-car garages as opposed to massive parking structures. Soils that are inherently less productive have a lot less capacity to attach all of these different nutrients, which exposes them to leaching. Imagine in this hypothetical parking garage, you send in 100 cars and you only have room to park 15. Well, what are the other 85 going to do? They've got to leave. Whereas in the darker soils, let's say you send in 100 cars and there's room for 100. Well, they can all stay. This is essentially what happens out here and why these darker soils are so much more productive because they can hold on to nutrients so much better. The only thing that's better at grabbing nutrients than the soil are the plants, which is why they are so synergistic. That example should really help you understand why we're splitting up our nitrogen. As opposed to overloading our soil all at once, if we split it into two applications, there is much less chance of waste in leaching through the soil, losing the nitrogen where it's ineffective for our corn crop. The longer we can keep our nitrogen attached to our soil particles, the better end result we should have come harvest time. There's more available nitrogen out there for our corn crop to utilize when it needs it and less wasted, which is bad for the environment in its own way, but I'm not gonna get into that. The nitrogen cycle is much more complex than I described. I don't know that I can concisely explain to you all the different factors that go into it, but that is a pretty simple idea of how we have to view our nitrogen and its interaction with the soil. I've never shied away from a challenge and I do love to talk, so I'm gonna give this a shot. Denitrification is the process where the ammonium cation, which is bonded to the soil particles, gets converted to nitrate, a negatively charged anion that will not stay on the soil. Imagine that all of our 100 car parking structures out here are at full capacity, 100 out of 100, and most of them are occupied by one type of car and that is ammonium. There is a very specific set of rascals that like to come into the parking garage when it is warmer than 50 degrees Fahrenheit and steal those certain cars and take them out of the parking garage for their own leisure. Now they're not doing it maliciously, but they just need that to survive. And the warmer it gets over 50 degrees, the more cars that leave the parking garage. The goons in this example are two microbial organisms that convert ammonium to nitrate. 
They are Nitrosomonas and Nitrobacter. As part of their metabolism, these two microbes convert ammonium to nitrite, which is NO2 with a negative charge, and then immediately to nitrate, which is NO3 with a negative charge. The process of converting it to nitrate means that it can no longer bind to soil particles. They can't get back in the parking garage. No one wants them there. Well, now they're free floating out in the streets, and when a tsunami comes, they're gonna get washed away. That is what happens to our nitrogen out in the field. The ammonium particles that are bound to the soil slowly get converted to nitrate, and either the plant uses them or they leach. Hopefully the plant uses them, but sometimes Mother Nature plays her hand, throws in a little bit too much precipitation, and it slowly washes through the soil profile to the point where the corn roots cannot reach it. There are a few preventative measures you can take to help slow this process, namely using nitrification inhibitors. Those are only a temporary solution. We utilize Inserve in the fall with our anhydrous ammonia. That buys us about four weeks of protection when the soil is warm. After that, it's open season. Other than the ammonium thiosulfate we have with the 32% UAN, which is relatively unproven as a stabilizer, we do not apply anything else with this product. That is part of the benefit of side dressing nitrogen. There is not as much of a need to protect that product because it shouldn't spend too much time out in the soil before the corn makes use of it. I'm not quite sure if that was a good explanation or not. I hope you kind of grasp the concepts, at least on a surface level. They're very complicated topics and they're actually much more complex than I described them as. There are multiple factors at hand here and it's hard to really describe all of them. Looks like the 32 bar is empty and going for some more juice. Dusty out there. Personally, I would like to be out there myself applying this nitrogen. Most retailers will provide you a toolbar with the purchase of the product to apply it if you want. Unfortunately though, the decision was above my pay grade. The boss didn't think it was worth our time to hook up our tractors and put it on ourselves by the time you account for wear and tear and depreciation. I think we could have saved a little bit of money by doing it in-house, but that's not my decision to make. We just get to sit and watch other people work. Really, I just wanted to do it to have something to do. We have everything planted, pre-planted, we don't do any spraying. I'm starting to get kind of bored. Helena's operator just pulled the tractor in, let it cool down, and then he headed home for the night, which gives us a perfect opportunity to check this rig out. It's not like they would have a shortage of horsepower. They have an 8400R, which is a 400 horse front wheel assist tractor, which is 90 horsepower more than what we used to pull our Exact Emerge planner. In this model year, the 400 horsepower tractor was the biggest one you can get. What do we have here? A John Deere 2530 liquid nitrogen toolbar. Since you always want your side dress bar to perfectly straddle your planter tracks, I would assume this is a 23 knife bar because there's 23 rows in between a 24 row planter. With nitrogen, it's actually not super important that you get it every row. There's a lot of research that shows every other row is actually an adequate method to applying nitrogen. Applying it every row just makes you sleep a little bit better at night. There's really not much to every individual row. You got a very big coulter, you got the knife I talked about, and then the UAN drips right down this tube at the bottom as it goes through the field. John Deere rate controller, individual section control. It's a sweet rig. I would have loved to run it. And it holds 18, oh no, 1900 gallons all the way up at the top. There's a lot of difference between 1800 and 1900, so maybe that's like a step to the brim. Usually with liquid products, you kind of want to avoid overloading them because when they bump through the field, you spill a little bit. Case in point, all this buildup on the back is probably nitrogen. Okay, everyone. I'm sure your brain's a little tired and your ears are a little bit worn out from all of my talking in this video. So I'm gonna go ahead and end it here. Thank you all for tuning in. Like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you wanna see more, and comment down below if you have any questions. I know I covered a lot of very dense topics, so do not hesitate to drop a question. There is no such thing as a bad question. Only the questions that go unasked qualify as that. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Have a great day. Peace.